Hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech24. I'm Julia Seeger. In this edition, we'll be looking more closely at the digital insurrection that has occurred in the last few days. Several companies decided to ban the U.S. president from their platforms because of comments igniting hate. Did it infringe on free speech or was it a legitimate move? Regardless of one's opinion, it marks a turning point for digital speech and a power shift towards Silicon Valley tech giants. And in Test24, we'll showcase a prototype submarine drone called Drix by the French startup IX Blue. It's proof of how performance subsea drones are becoming, collecting high quality data even in rough waters. But first, the Consumer Electronics Show 2021 has unsurprisingly displayed a multitude of COVID-related robots and gadgets, as well as products that make it easier to work from home. But there has also been more of the usual suspects, from endless laptops and TVs to smart fridges and the much-awaited flying car. While our tech editor is here on set with us, you actually contributed to this report. What were some of your favorite tech out of the trade show? Yeah, Julia, so I think a lot of the big trends we saw were around more uses of 5G, and we've started to see AI really being infused in, into absolutely everything. But for my report, I wanted to focus on the stuff that really grabbed my eye, the kind of the most viral stuff. But I do have to issue a trigger warning first because it starts with a terrible pun. With nobody there, CES wasn't exactly rocking like usual. Hello. But it was rolling with rollable screens this year's fad. LG teased an unfurling phone and a TV which pops up from the foot of your bed and can even become transparent. While Razer's Project Brooklyn is a gamer's dream with a display that culls out in front of you so you can completely block out the rest of the world. There are plenty of gadgets for those who do have to go outside and stay safe while they're at it, with various smart masks, like the mask phone with earbuds and a mic to make calls easier, and Razer's Project Hazel, which has speakers to amplify your voice and, of course, RGB lighting. World's smartest mask can be. You've been on your computer too long. As well as staying safe, those of us working from home need help staying sane, which lots of new video conferencing gadgets may or may not help with. The conference call is scheduled in a few minutes. Inverse showed off software that recreates you in 3D, in case one day you need to see your colleagues or loved ones in more than two dimensions. And Samsung is offering to take a load off with the housekeeping. JetBot 90 AI Plus. Their new robot vacuum uses LiDAR and object recognition in a bid to never again get stuck, while their bot's handy concept fetches you things and even loads the dishwasher. If a one-armed hug from a block of plastic with a face isn't enough companionship for you, there were various clever cuddlies, like Mofflin, whose creators say uses algorithms to develop its own personality over time. And if that's not quite the same kind of companionship that you were after, well, there's good news, because it was also a very strong year for smart sex toys. But I'll leave that to you to look into. The messaging platforms Signal and Telegram have recently seen a huge surge in downloads around the world following a controversial update to WhatsApp's terms and conditions. The app sent a notifications to its 2 billion users around the world to allow it to share data with its parent company, Facebook, if they wish to continue using it. Or for many, this was actually it. They decided to quit the app to protect their personal data. Well, to understand a little bit more about this update and its consequences, let's turn to Craig Chappell, Mobile Insights Strategist, EMEA at Sensor Tower. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Hi there, thank you for having me. So we understand that WhatsApp users will not be able to continue with the service unless they accept the new terms and conditions by February 8th. Uh, that applies for uh, users in the United States and not so much for users in Europe and the UK. But what is this update all about and what does it actually change for users? Uh, that's right. It's not actually... Um... Uh, for European users, thanks to uh, data protection laws here. But the changes are actually to do with WhatsApp business. So uh, individual users, your messages won't be tracked or calls won't be listened to or anything like that. The change uh, that will come into force fully on uh, February 8th is um, uh, when you message a business, 
uh, those messages could be tracked and the business could use that for marketing purposes and also how you might shop within the WhatsApp ecosystem. That data can also be tracked. So you might you might get surfaced items that are more relevant to you, or uh, when you or even outside of the WhatsApp platform. If you go to Instagram or Facebook, you might get relevant ads based on how you are shopping within WhatsApp. So that's the big difference there. Now, we, we said it earlier, Craig, in the wake of this notification, many people actually switch to rival messaging apps like Signal or, or Telegram. So tell us more about the extent of this phenomenon, if you actually have data about this, and whether you think it's a definitive move by people who are just done with big tech messing with their personal data. So there's definitely been a big move to private messaging apps such as Signal and Telegram. So Sensor Tower data shows that from January 5th to 12th, so that's I believe the day after uh, the rule change, uh, the privacy changes were announced, um, Signal generated in that time 17.8 million downloads. To put that into perspective, from the previous week, that was a, a 60 times increase. And Telegram generated 15.7 million downloads, which was double the previous period. And WhatsApp downloads actually fell uh, slightly, 17% to 10.6 million downloads in that period. Um, I don't think necessarily uh, people are going to turn away from WhatsApp. It's already generated critical mass, uh, 5.6 billion downloads since January 2014. This app isn't going anywhere. And yes, I think users are now taking their private data more seriously. But I believe this, uh, what we're actually seeing is people will now use Signal and Telegram perhaps on top of WhatsApp, because ultimately all your friends and family are probably still on WhatsApp. Well, thank you very much indeed for that, Craig Chapel. And let's move now from people voluntarily leaving platforms to people getting kicked off of them for their views that are considered inappropriate or inciting violence. The phenomenon is called deplatforming or removing controversial accounts with masses of followers or blocking entire sites. It's a trend that's not actually new but that has gained attention following the fact that the tech world came out in force this past week against President Trump following the storming of the U.S. Capitol. Well, to speak more about it, uh, Peter, tell us maybe more examples. I said that it's not an actually new of a trend, but what are some other examples? We've not seen a figure so massive as Donald Trump being deplatformed before, so it's hard to say what impact all of that is going to have. But I can take you back through some other examples. So, for example, Britain First in the UK, a far-right group, Facebook banned them from its sites. Reddit has taken down a number of its forums. For example, there's one which uh, encouraged a lot of misogyny. And there was also Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist who founded Infowars, who many major platforms banned as well. So what do we know about the actual impact of deplatforming? Uh, where do those communities actually go? There is evidence to show that once these communities move off, they do become smaller. And this reduces the general, the, the masses uh, exposure to kind of extreme messaging. So if you look at Britain first, their influence uh, waned, it was, it was hobbled after they had to move to Gab, which is much smaller than Facebook. And research from Cornell University showed that users um, of Reddit's forums, which were encouraging this kind of uh, misogyny, for example, when they had to move to their own uh, specific websites, traffic was was decimated and with alex jones well once he was deplatformed he fell off the list of most watched uh, talk shows so we know that after deplatforming uh, communities are going to be dispersed but what about hate speech is it actually reduced i'd say it's likely not to de-radicalize people with the most extreme views and the same bit of cornell research showed that when you move these masses of people off big platforms to smaller ones although you're reducing the exposure you could actually be encouraging an even more extreme form of speech within those smaller communities and then that's not even to mention the issue around censorship people are people are questioning whether this deplatforming is is censorship and does harm the health of uh, public discourse on the internet and on the other side of the coin, you've got big tech companies who people are accusing that what they're doing is, 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 is using their own political beliefs to influence these deplatforming decisions. Now, it's quite hypocritical because in the first place, we wouldn't have this debate if big tech indeed didn't exist. 
I think you might be right with that. The way these sites work, the way they're designed, is around algorithms that encourage the biggest posts possible because the bigger a post is, the more traffic there is, the more money from advertising. And what gets the most clicks? Well, I still think it's probably the most extreme and the most strident views. So although tech companies, some think, are helping because they are deplatforming, if they're doing that, they're only helping solve a problem they help create. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Peter, for that. We're going to move on now to Test24. Drones are considered to be the next great leap in hydrography. And today on the set of Test24, we actually have proof of that. We have a small orange little submarine. It's a model, but actually in real life, it does exist and it's up and running. Technically, Julia, it's actually a unmanned surface vehicle, not a submarine. It's a USV and in real life, it's 7.7 .7 meters long. And what it does is you can connect lots of sensors to it and it surveys the seabed. So maps out the hydrography of what's underwater. This has lots of uses, military, scientific to resource extraction. And really, this kind of proves that USVs are now a viable solution and not just a fantasy anymore. So that's it for, for going on the surface, of course, but some drones can actually go underwater and explore um, the seabeds. Yeah, so, the, well, there's a few uses for, for submarine drones as well, and French company Eka is one of the pioneers with this. They have a, they were the first company to develop a nautical robotic minesweeper, and we can see now that they actually sell entire systems of drones designed to hunt down mines and blow them up. So this is their one searching for the mine, looking around the water for it. Here's another one that they launch out to make the mine explode. Now, obviously, you lose the drone when you do this, um, and you there's always a risk you could like blow up any of this equipment so it is but it is worth of course the um the, the cost of the lives saved when you when you lose a drone like that thank you very much indeed for that peter o'brien our tech editor that brings us to the end of this week's edition of tech 24 see you soon